This is the third talk about the Adenauer years between 1949 and 1963. We're going to be looking at uh, three specific areas. Uh, first of all, looking at the uh, how the Adenauer years and the Adenauer government dealt with the Nazi past. Um, and also to look at the foreign policy aspect as well, which sort of links into this, but we're going to be looking at that, that a bit later. And then between, we're just going to look at the changes in society that was going on between uh, in the, during this period of where we've got economic boom. Dealing with the Nazi legacy, obviously uh, between the 45 and 49 period, one of the key aims of the Allies had been denazification. Uh, de this had been carried out to a greater or lesser extent by the occupying powers, um, the most obvious being um, the, the uh, Soviet pe uh, zone being the one that had gone most um, stringently down this route. Um, by the time 1949 came along, um, you get to see the, uh, the problem that the Adenauer government had in the sense that they needed a fully functioning state. This is all linked in to do with the Cold War. And so more often than not, people who had experience had to come back from um, the, the, being ostracized in the 45-49 period uh, who had dealings with the Nazi state and uh, re be reinstated. Probably the most famous being of these was Hans Globke, head of the Chancellor's Office between 1953 and 63, who had actually been involved in the drafting of Nazi anti-Semitic legislation in the 1930s. You've also got in the earlier period the fact that the, the judiciary quite often did very little against sadistic um, Nazi judges who in the Nazi period as well, so quite often they kept their jobs. Um, this obviously damaged Germany's uh, reputation abroad and so that um, it looked like they were doing very little if anything to do with their uh, their reputation and often it was they were criticized just hiding uh, putting their head in the sand and, and, and just doing nothing however things were being done um, in other areas so that for example moves were co uh, done to com compensate victims of national socialism and extremist parties were banned by the constitutional co court so people who had lost um, property or money uh, there was some sort of restitution for this Probably the most, second most famous member of the, of the Nazi party who continued being in a high position was Theodor Oberlander, who was the advising officer of the Wehrmacht on the minority questions on the Eastern Front, ironically becoming the Minister for Displaced Persons and Refugees between 1953 and 1960. As I said to you, there was a little on the side to this, and one of the key ones was the signing of a reconciliation treaty between Israel and West Germany in 1952. This again tried to um, give restitution to the, uh, the Israel, newly established Israeli state and to Jews who had lost property and uh, money uh, between 1933 and 1945. This continued right through to about 2007 and I think something along the lines of 20 billion euros have been uh, passed over to the Israeli state for that. Um, since the beginning of the 1950s, sorry, the end of the 1950s, you start to get trials against war criminals and guards of concentration camps. And then the Z committee was set up, as you can see, I'm not going to even attempt to try and lead that out. Um, the idea in 1958 this was, and this was, the, their job was to look at um, cases against uh, alleged ex-Nazis and uh, bring up evidence so that they could uh, put on, be put on trial. Uh, this continued after 1990 against um, the ex-communist state and officials in that, so it was uh, very much expanded. This is the committee, uh, and uh, it's still going even now, as I say, uh, and they have vast amounts of resources and records uh, going back through to the 1933 period. Historians published books on the Holocaust and debated the, the issue. Critical novels, poems, theatre productions and films on the Nazi past were made. Uh, also in this period, probably the most famous being uh, Gunter Grass's The Tin Drum. The 50s, well, we're looking at the social period, social, the social aspects of the period now. And um, this has got to link, we've got to remember, this is linked in with the fact of economic uh, prosperity and also uh, the Marshall Plan. Linked in with this is the dominance of Hollywood. A lot of American films were being shown in this, uh, in, during this period, but also German films were being made, so so-called Heimat films to do with um, growing up, quite often historical films to do with the homeland or village life or town life, sometimes romances and sometimes things called CC films about the Austrian Empress Elizabeth. 
Um, often these looked at things to do with unchanged social order and were often seen as kitschy and we'll talk a little bit about the music aspect of that as well a bit later on. Um, you even had some westerns in the 1960s and thrillers. A very successful period in the box office, many, many people go into the cinema. Um, some problem films were being made because obviously there were problems in that society. Uh, sometimes films to, uh, actually made in the East, so for example, Der Untertan um, was made in the East and released in the West, and also films to do with the issue of um, troubled, so-called troubled youth. So a film like De Halbstark in 1957 with Horst Buchholz, who was a, a key German actor at this period, uh, looked at the German riots, it actually translates as something along the lines of the teenage wolf pack. Here we have two posters. On the right hand side is the film I've just been talking about. On the left hand side is the types of films that were often looked at in a very conservative uh, look at the past and the, and the present. Um, linked in with this sort of uh, complacency, you've got um, types of the type of music, often very uh, American based or, or based on sort of the type of German folk music. Uh, this was known as Schlager music and 80% um, of all copies sold during this period was known as Schlager and even, even today you can uh, hear Schlager music in fact um, this we can talk about it in terms of you, what you understand would be uh, Euro pop or um, Eurovision music. Here's an example of it. And that was uh, Astrid Harbachen with Zigerner uh, Junge. Here we can see the growth of Americanization, type of American types of music and films coming along. Even uh, Elvis himself was stationed in West Germany uh, from about 1958 onwards. So what about foreign policy then? Well, what were Adenauer's aims? His aims was international recognition by integration, democratization by westernization. Basically what that means is he wanted to integrate West Germany into Europe and also into the uh, Western alliances. And this would uh, mean that Germany, West Germany would have to be democratic. Uh, there was a reconciliation with France and also develop a close relationship with the United States, which was essential for security in this Cold War period. Um, aims the Western powers also fitted in nicely with this because rather than revenge directly as had happened in the first, after the First World War, they thought that by integrating Germany into uh, Europe and the Western alliance, this would mean that there, it would no longer be a threat. Factors which helped to rehabilitation, as I said, mentioned before, the perceived Soviet threat, the Cold War period after 1949, and so uh, German participation was needed for this, and also the Korean War, mainly because uh, it showed that Germany was a good ally. So, uh, we've got a list of key uh, dates there. The key ones we need to look at are the earlier ones, which are the beginnings of the uh, European uh, Union, um, we've got the signing in Paris of the European Coal and Steel Community through by France, Brit uh, France, West Germany, uh, Benelux, and Italy. This was then uh, moved on to uh, the uh, European Defence Community, and also ultimately into 1957, the Treaty of Rome being signed, and that setting up of the European Economic Community proper. Another aspect we need to look at, of course, is uh, what was going on with East Germany and the Cold War. Uh, 1952, you also get the uh, Stalin note offering the United Neutral Germany, more about that later. And then, of course, um, the problem with uh, Berlin, the Berlin Ultimatum in 1958 by Khrushchev, where he was basically saying that the position of Berlin needs to be uh, dealt with because so many people were moving from East Germany through to Berlin and uh, West Berlin and then going on to West Germany. So he wanted something doing about that because there was having a large number of people leaving. Basically he wanted uh, the whole of Berlin to be a free uh, city. Um, 
this eventually led to the building of the Berlin Wall because the issue of Berlin was never dealt with and then you've got the Berlin Wall being set up in 1961. The other major uh, strand in all of this is the uh, signing of the Paris Agreements whereby basically um, West Germany becomes a sovereign state in uh, 1955 and therefore was allowed to have its own army and rearm which caused a lot of consternation, especially with France. But as I say, by 1957, this to some extent had been allayed because of the whole issue of integration into both NATO and into the EEC. And then you get another aspect of this, which was the Halstein Doctrine, which basically said that it was very important that Germany, um, West Germany, um, was Germany basically that East Germany was a doesn't exist as a state it was a occupied zone and effectively was propped up by the Soviet Union and any state that did recognize uh, the GDR would be shunned by the West and this to some extent did happen with countries like Cuba and Yugoslavia although it didn't actually happen a great deal with every single country that did um, accept the GDR uh, obviously it was um, it was rather hit and miss in this respect um, or <clears throat> this was started in 1955 and starts to be phased out around about the late 60s. Um, we see here two posters that deal with uh, the whole issue of uh, the rise of German rearmament. On the left hand side, the SPD very much against it. On the right hand side, showing that German soldiers would be comrades in arms with the other allies. Although uh, this was also played out much wider in uh, Europe as well. And Germany, or West Germany, finally put these issues aside when uh, Conrad Adenauer and Charles de Gaulle met in 1962. Uh, about the Stalin note, which was the uh, issue about what should happen to Germany, here was Stalin offering that Ger West Germany or the whole of Germany should be a neutral, um, united country. And he meant this as a possible way of trying to uh, upset German rearmament, but also it could be seen as a serious offer to bring about peace. We don't know. And this led on eventually to the building of the Berlin Wall um, in 1961, as I mentioned before. Um, more about this later when we look at the GDR, but obviously this had a, a big impact both psychologically, politically, and geographically. It basically cut East Europe, Eastern Germany off from West Germany completely now.